Um, all right, so for anyone who was not in the room, let's, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing at L'Oreal. Give, a, give the brief intro, because your title alone could take 45 sure. minutes. Um, so all intents and purposes, I'm the head of media for, uh, for Couture at L'Oreal. Um, up until June this year, it was four brands. It was Prada, Valentino, Mugler, and Victor and & Rolf. Uh, but now it's just Prada and Valentino, because those businesses have gangbusters grown. Um, Valentino, for instance, when I joined in 2022, has gone from number 23 fragrance to number three. Um, so like it's been a massive growth there. Both of these brands have multiple what we call axes underneath them. So Valentino has makeup and fragrance. Prada has skincare, makeup, and fragrance. Um, so there's five different product lines. And within my responsibility realm, I'm in charge of three different budgets. Uh, entire D2C budget, media budget. So that's really focused on performance, transactional. Um, my retail.com budget, which is Macy's.com, MMN, you know, Sephora.com, Ulta.com, uh, and then my pure media awareness budget, which is basically everything from out-of-home print to programmatic, digital, and everything else, parties, blah, blah, blah. So it's safe to say, like, you work across a lot of different channels. All of them. All, every channel. And things right. that we haven't even thought of yet, yes. Ooh, that, tease that later. Yes. So what are some of the biggest challenges you're facing as you're in these kind of growth stages brand and operating across dozens of different channels? People with lack of vision. Let's, let's go into that a little bit more. Yeah, uh, look, complacency is rife in our industry. I've, I've got in this industry in 2006, uh, Neo at Ogilvy uh, as a digital planner and progressed into comm strategy. And... Comm strategy, I feel, is like a, a practice. It really, it came to the U.S. around like 2015 to 17. Um, it's a very particular practice within our marketing sphere where it brings in media, creative, brand strategy. It mashes all up into one cross-functional person and like spits them out to try to be as flexible, fast, and accurate in how you go to market within an organization. Not many folks have comm strategist positions. A lot of agencies are now have more comm strategists, um, but how you empower them is different. And so my biggest thing as, you know, I'm the head of media, but really I'm a comm strategist because I interpret the brand comms from the fashion house in terms of what does that mean for my local market. And culture moves faster than data. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The human brain is the best computer on the face of the planet. And we move so fast that Sometimes your heart needs to lead with how you go to market. And in order to do that, you have to predict where the humans are going to be in six months. Because sometimes you only have between like six to a year to plan media. So you have to kind of guess where the market's going to be. So in that, you have to have vision in terms of where is Gen Z slash like younger millennials going to be with what they want in like six to nine months from now with all like the crap I got to deal with when it comes to you know, budgets and internal politics and all that kind of stuff, but like making sure you keep like the seed of innovation front and center. And a lot of people have a tough time understanding what that really means. Um, they want to pay lip service to it. Like, oh, we do like the, 20, uh, the 2010 budget, which I think is a really good way to do it, but who has ever actually pulled off a 2010 budget? Well, like, because when you pitch something for that 2010, people are going to crap on it. And then it's no longer 10, it's like 1%, if at all, when it comes to like funding the innovative things that move your business forward. So really like lack of vision from people in, leads to red tape, and that leads to the stiflement of an innovation. Well, I mean, you mentioned yesterday that everything L'Oreal does is polished, right? Yeah. So there is um, layers of approval that you have to go through. You're working on like two-year timelines, I think you talked about. So how are you able to work through that red tape and still create cultural moments if culture moves faster than data? Well, Tamika said it best yesterday. You got to bring people along with you, you know, on this journey. Um, honey over sticks. Like, for me, I live the brands. Living L'Oreal attracts certain people that want to work with you mm -hmm. and, like, believe in what you do. It's a very personality-driven business. Honestly, our industry is a very personality-driven industry. So, like, you have to be someone that people just want to work with. Yeah. Uh, and then, after that, you have to be very patient, which is something I've had to learn in my career since 2006 when I was coming up as a young buck. <laughs> Um, but you got to be patient in time, especially for media. Time is our tool. Yeah. Like I'm going, like, even though no one's thinking about lifetime value, I'm watching that gate. I'm thinking about what is the consumer journey progression over three years versus like what I have to do this quarter to get my bonus. Yeah. 
and we are the ones that watch that gate. And so time is our tool. So you have to win people to your cause, think about what time means for you, and then mold that time to get to the objective that you want. Now, this might be a hidden agenda. It might be completely out there agenda. But no matter what, you have to have a vision and a goal yeah. uh, because a lot of people around you will not. So uh, the complacency is more on the marketers who aren't striving Absolutely. for that innovation or just Absolutely. running another search ad or doing another BAU type of thing sure. versus the 80-20 rule almost. Yeah, and I know that we're going to probably talk about like 360 stuff uh, a lot in this conversation. So like, yeah, when you're thinking about like a cohesive 360 go-to-market plan, uh, to make sure everyone's like, my brand team are not programmatic specialists. My brand team are not traditional media specialists. Like, they really know the brand well. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they kind of have to, one, they have to trust me to let them know, like, look, this is how we go to market in a smart way. I'm not gonna get in the weeds of, you know, these are the partners we're using for programmatic with the brand team. Like, what the fuck are they? Oh, so what close. What are they going to do with that information? I was so proud of you with crap. I was like, we've turned a corner. We've done. But what are they going to do with that information? Yeah. Not a damn thing. Now that the, the, the levy's gone, like, it's just <laughs> floods. they're not going to do anything with that information. Like, but I know that information. And so, like, you know, again, some, agen some agendas are hidden. Some agendas are out there. And everything works together. Like, there's nothing surreptitious about this. But, you know, sometimes it just has to be a need-to-know basis to get your agenda done. Well, and we forget that, you know, in this room, we're a bunch of marketers, right? Or if you work with your agency, you're working with a bunch of marketers. But I imagine your primary stakeholder or the people that you talk to most, like, they're not in marketing. They're not in the day-to-day. -day. So you're, you're adjusting your conversation to fulfill what they're looking for. How do you, how do you adapt to that? Well, we, in, our, in our round table, our awesome round table with, like, Kelsey yesterday, he's a fucking beast. He's a beast, wherever you are. Thank you for the round table. There you are. What a round table yesterday. Woo, woo, woo. Um, and so, like, you know, in that round table, we talked about a lot of things, you know, like, basically dealing with that. Uh, fuck, I lost my track after I, like, I'm just giving my girl props here. What was the question <laughs> one more time? Let me bring it back real quick. Um, I'm adjusting your conversation ah, to not talk to marketers. Yeah. Uh, as our job as media folks, mostly, um, or wherever your titles are, we need to adjust the nomenclature around our environment. Mm. Since we are the experts of what we do, then we need to create the language around what we do. And if you create the language, you can create the frame by which everyone else talks about what you do. And if you control the language, you control the output, you control the vision, you control the case study. Um, so if you say, I don't know, let's give you something. Uh, my video completion rate led to higher time spent which means, uh, you know, our leg up over, I don't know, Christian Dior that only did six second ads versus our long form 30. We should be doing long form 30s because look at this particular segment here. It's popping with like longer form content and we know our competitors aren't doing anything with that. The only thing the brand team is gonna hear from that is we want longer form content. Yeah. They don't care about the rest. Yeah. Uh, but all of that, I just like littered a whole bunch of media words and nomenclature in there. and. Over time, they get to know what all those things mean, but I defined what those mean. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I'm able to string together something like that, it's believable and it's proven out. It'll never be surreptitious. And you have the data to back it up. If the they ask, up, why like, do we want to go there? Like, yeah. but, but, you know, the, the back end on YouTube might call what I call something different, but I'm interpreting it in the language that I created within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so, like, language is so important to bring people along in your vision, and you want to control that language. Yeah. So we talked a lot about digital. Um, where does traditional media fall in your your day to day? Dude, don't sleep on traditional media. Uh, I'm a huge proponent, and always have been in my career, of using old things new, in a new way. Um, a lot of like, unfortunately, and I've, I've like my agency really hit me hard on this. Uh, I'm not, I'm not of the mind that print is dead. Uh, it's with Gen Z. Now, I've been proven time and time again that it is. <laughs> um, I still refuse to believe that because, and I said this yesterday as a foreshadow, uh, in my line of work with fragrance, there's no other medium to what we say, get the juice in people's hands, like get the fragrance in people's hands to smell it, than print, yeah. scent strips. Yeah. Y'all still use the strips? That's <laughs> the only way I will be in print, is I have to have a scent strip in there. Yeah. I will not do like a page ad or something. It has to be with the scent. Um, so in that regard, like, even though really Gen Z is not buying print, it's 
very well proven. And for me, even me, I'm like, when was the last time I actually bought a freaking magazine? I really can't even remember when that was. But here I am funding it as a marketer. Now, what I will say is there's a way, to, this is, I'm only using print as a microcosm to give you the macro of the answer. But like, print is an old medium that you can do differently. And how do you do that? A lot of the companies are innovating in print now, for instance, where they're only doing like half, like so nylon came back, for instance. Mm -hmm. They're only doing two issues this year. And it's like, they're making a moment out of the issue, so it supersedes print, and it becomes a media moment. Mm -hmm. I wanna be there. And so like, so when you do traditional and new ways, like I was actually just had an, an awesome conversation today with Ad Theorin, um, cause I'm very familiar with Caden, and I guess, I mean, th that's probably not proprietary information that they just bought Ad Theorin, I guess. But, you know, we were talking about the white space and penetration. How do I use my linear to be able to, you know, retarget, uh, you know, my ads on CTV and then follow up with the sample? Because yeah. they can do all of that within house. That's like, I got to find ways to use old traditional model in a new way. Because yeah. we're still using these things. Well, and, and all of these legacy brands, they got started marketing on print, right? So you're working with stakeholders who know the reliance on print. Yeah, and I know. Yeah, when I was at Arby's and Home Depot, as much as marketers saying print is dead, print is dead, if we pulled print from a market, sales dropped, period, yeah, yeah. right? So there's no way that we can't figure out how to adapt and adjust that, whether that's getting those consumers to digital channels or, to your sense, adapting that particular thing in a in a moment or cultural time. This is je ne sais quoi of measurement. Yeah. There are just some things we would have to be honest with ourselves that we just cannot measure. Yeah. And whatever that is, like I see like, I'm a huge sci-fi guy, so I'm gonna give you a little metaphor here. Uh, black holes, for instance. You can't technically really see a black hole You well, when you discover it. You find, you look for the areas you can see, and then you see the areas you can't. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know where a black hole is. Mm -hmm. Same thing with measurement in our business. You know that you're successful somewhere in the mix of your 360, but just by looking at the overall tableau, you know it's there, but you don't know what it is specifically that worked. Yeah. And anyone that tells you, oh, this worked like this, you don't know this because my media budget is the largest part of the entire P&L of my business. It's like 50 to 60% of the entire P&L of our business for Prada and Valentino. But there's so much other stuff that goes on in marketing around me that I am very much cautious for media to put too much on its back mm -hmm. when it comes to the success or failure of one of my products that we go out with. Media should not take all this on its shoulders. Now we are a big piece of it, but you know, we can live in the success, but you also have to die with the failure too, if you do want that kind of smoke, if you want that kind of attention. Uh, so yeah, sorry. No, so as we talk into measurement, um, what's your kind of philosophy on getting down to the exact number, the exact last kick attribution, like this is exactly what this channel drove versus using data as directional? Because yeah. at the end of the day, there is going to be a million different people can claim that like I have this data, I have this data, it's clean data, but like no data is clean. Like mm -hmm. there is no such thing as clean 100% data. So where's the balance between the exact and the directional in order to do your job? Man, what a great, great question. Um, when I was at, let's see, okay, so early in my career I was in entertainment a lot. I was, I was in HBO for about two years, first season of Game of Thrones, Warwick Empire, last season of Entourage, True Blood season four, which I won almost, almost four. Entertainment, entertainment taught me a lot about, and I was like also at ABC on, at Wyden and Kennedy on like Modern Family and stuff. It taught me a lot about not having to measure everything. Mm. Uh, entertainment, if you talk to, like probably a lot of you guys talk to folks that are in entertainment. The only thing that matters about entertainment is did you get butts and seats in the movie theater in the first two weeks of the movie coming out? Uh, so usually you're in market for a month and you can't replicate a movie campaign. Like you can't replicate that because every movie is different, has a different audience. And so what does measurement really mean there? It's not about measurement, it's about impact. Um, and then you can start to measure impact, but it doesn't mean it's a replicable model to be successful. It's just how did you do that time around? Hopefully you have transferable learning. Um, but I've carried that learning throughout my entire career. So even like at Lysol where I didn't work with walled gardens, I worked with like Walgreens or Target and they're more than happy to share their sales information with you. We could do multi-touch attribution there. Um, but even still like, no one is the no one is going to be the marketer that's exposed to that banner ad that gives it the attribution to buy, like, and there's nothing else that I mean, multi-touch attribution tries to do this, but it doesn't measure out of home, it yeah. doesn't measure TV, it doesn't measure print, and all these things. It takes everything on the shoulders of itself, yeah. and that is not really truly measurement. That is an estimated guess, yeah. and so you can't get exact in measurement. Don't even try. Yeah. 
What you can do with measurement, though, is make the story of success. And that's kind of what I did with the example I did before. All of these things are directional, but all of these things go into a finite story. And that story gets time capsuled, and then that's what you use the next time around. So as, we, um, as we're going to talk about some digital and technical experiences today, where do you see AI fitting into your day to day? Uh -huh. Like, is it theoretical of AI is gonna change the world or are there actionable use cases that you're implementing that has made your job easier? I'll put my John Connor hat on for a second. Like Nobles is a Terminator reference for some folks here. <laughs> uh, like me as a person, Nobles, I think AI is gonna definitely change this world. More like in a socioeconomic approach versus like a media approach, I think AI right now has been more like a, a gimmick in our industry, to be quite honest. There are like some really like true applications of it with a lot of the companies. Um, but I think that m at least like for people, even on like the brand side or agency side, AI, you can just say AI and not get anywhere deeper in the conversation. Yeah. We have AI and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Like, okay, the agency person is not asking you, well, is it predictive or generative? They're not even asking that. Yeah. And it's like, when you're not even like starting off with the most basic of questions, what does AI really mean for our industry? So when it comes to like the adoption of AI, because I don't want to be like a naysayer here that there is nothing there for what we do, there, there certainly is, it needs to be a measured approach. I think that it's the first benefit we have is probably from an operational perspective. We need to stop being in the weeds of planning and just be humans again. Because marketers, we as marketers are still humans. We are still affected by the industry that we're in. And so I think that AI is gonna help us like take a step back from getting too into it by like, you know, automating analysis, like automating, you know, putting together like the right insights with all the inputs of data you have going on so we can think about what's next more. You know, thankfully I have a team that I've created the ecosystem where I can now think about what's next as the machine runs and I can continue to push my business forward. I think AI becomes that machine, and now we can unlock so many more brains about how do we advance not only our brand, but our culture when it comes to marketing. Because there's a lot of things that we gotta talk about. I mean, we, you know, we, were, just, we were always talking about the, you know, uh, the cookie deprecation, but that's just like the tip of the iceberg right now. Like, what goes on when there's like the major transfer of you know, wealth, you know, power, like the entire generation of boomers is about to hand over the keys to an entire few generations that have been screwed by them. What does that look like when it comes to our media consumption and the kind of innovation now that we unlock with like maybe the new policies we have from like a federal government perspective to deregulate some like media things, but then also like add some restrictions on others like what's going on in the Congress right now around social media networks yeah. and like the youth. All of these things we're gonna deal with. No one can tell you what the future of marketing looks like. So we need to unlock being in the weeds and think about what's next. So you've worked on some very fun campaigns, both at L'Oreal with Lysol during the pandemic, your Samsung background in um, entertainment. Like what's, what's the standout media activation? Like what's your favorite thing that you've ever done? <laughs> I mean, the product candy, Candy Crush, which I did the keynote for was pretty good. Um, so talk a little bit about that, can about that campaign. Yeah, so. I almost got fired for this one. Uh, it was like when we- when Love we, this. Yeah, when, when I first started at L'Oreal uh, in 2022, like uh, an idea just went, well, one of my good friends from Chip Advisor, she had just left, she had loved it over there, but she had just gone to Activision. And, uh, and, and Activision owns Candy Crush, uh, you know, the king uh, casual mobile games. And now mobile gaming is like another place that's like rife uh, for disruption right now uh, when it comes from like a marketer's pers perspective. And that's what I did. So basically I had convinced everyone on the editorial side of King to allow me to borrow their IP just for a little bit and mash it up with Prada. Now, I didn't talk to Mucha Prada about this, who's the head of the Prada household. Um, she's amazing. Uh, I talked to my bosses about this and they tried to kill it five times. And it was a very little amount of money. And I'm like, yo, this is like literally 0.01% of my media budget. Wait, so you're going to your bosses and you're like, hey, um, we need to pair Prada with Candy Crush. Thoughts? Yeah, and they're like, what the fuck are you doing, Nobles? <laughs> casual gaming, and I'm like, you gotta trust me, like this will work. Yeah. Uh, and they said no five times. My bosses, like two of them, the GM of the business uh, and the, the VP of the business. Now, by hook or crook here, which is like a Southern statement, but like, you know, we're gonna make it, basically. I'm g I have this vision, we're gonna make this. Cause I wouldn't let me sleep. Like Prada Candy Candy Crush, the alliteration told me it was gonna be a hit. <laughs> and so I kinda like went around my bosses by accident, uh, cause I didn't really know the process yet. I had just joined L'Oreal. 
Uh, and I went around them and went to what we call DMI, which is like our internal creative agency, and they're out of Paris, because they're our liaison between the fashion house and local markets. And they liked the idea, and they brought it to Mucha Prada. Uh, Mucha Prada loved the idea, and they were like, you're greenlit for this. And I'm like, fuck, my bosses are, think they killed this. What did your bosses say? <laughs> Uh, well, pause. the dramatic pause. So was thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, I'm in charge of the media budget, so I kind of like hid this money, uh, <laughs> and uh, and then the DMI kind of worked on it on the side, like in a in like a in a in a dark site, and then they kind of the popped out, and then once we went to market with it, I dropped it on Thanksgiving because my insight was, if I want to hit Gen Z women and millennial women, like more than likely they're probably with in-laws and stuff during Thanksgiving or the rest of the family, and they they are way tired of them by the time like Thanksgiving night comes. So I dropped the game on Thanksgiving night, knowing that women of this certain age would probably be on their phones, doing casual gaming. Uh, dropped that, we had 40,000 samples, because it was like, complete this mini game, which is like fully seamless within the product, within the Candy Crush gaming, because I used their IP, you couldn't really distinguish between their game and when my ad started, uh, because they had, we, were the, we were the first brand they actually let borrow the IP for. They believed in the vision too. Uh, and so we had 40,000 samples, that's supposed to last us two weeks, it lasted us less than 24 hours. We went through 40,000 samples from the night of Thanksgiving until like the afternoon of the next morning for our new, or for product candy. I retargeted those people later. We increased our site traffic by 1,800% for about two weeks. We had to shut down the campaign, retool the comms because we we're not giving away samples anymore. Uh, came back out 48 hours later uh, and then retargeted about 70,000 people that interacted with this game with our new fragrance that came out about a month later. And then that went on to give Prada Paradox as the most successful women's launch in L'Oreal history for a fragrance. And Prada Candy Crush was one of the reasons that happened because I was able to take that audience and then give them the Emma Watson new. And then boom, there now, it is. And that was around holiday. Before we open it up to, to the audience for questions, now did you go to your bosses and you were like, I told you so. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 you, don't, you do not fuck with the GM of luxury. Uh, no, but I will say, they didn't say anything to me. In the French culture of business, there is no good job. They never say good job. Uh, that does not happen here. But the one thing I did get after almost being fired, because they were like, what the hell did you do, Nobles? Like, you're not supposed to go to the fashion house with us. Like, I didn't know, like, it was, it was tough for a bit. Um, but they gave me my flowers a little bit when the head of Lincoln, which is the biggest budget basically within L'Oreal, sent a three-word email to my GM being like, it's just two words. It was, I got written up in Glossy for this, which is like, you know, pretty good, pretty good uh, publication. And she sent her this article that was written up in, and she said, nice job. And she sent it to my GM. My GM forwarded it to me. She was like, got this from the Lancome GM, but never do this again. <laughs> and I kept my job, and that's a good job enough for me. On that note, we'll open it up to the audience for a few questions. <laughs> I mean, I could be up here all day if you guys don't have questions. We, so, we yeah. haven't even talked about like agency client relationship. Yeah. How do you break in with like a red tape bureaucracy, like from a publisher perspective? We can talk about anything. Well, we got about five minutes left, so you better think quick if you have questions. Here we go. Hey. Here we go. All right, crushing. Can you remind us who you are? Yeah. Hi, I'm Kelsey. I uh, run digital media at Gucci. Great conversation, guys. Thank you so much. As always, entertaining and informational. Um, question about, and Noble's kind of going back to our conversation at the round table yesterday, kind of crafting that narrative and marrying that with measurement, thinking about traditional media channels. Are you preemptively getting buy-in that there maybe won't be measurement tied to every activation? To your point, we are the largest piece of the P&L. So, and finance is so used to that Google Analytics last click. Like, what's the ROAS going to be? And for so many activations, that's incredibly irrelevant. So how are you, are you getting ahead of that? Is it at the end that you kind of bring in that it's magic and not measurement maybe in this case? Like, how are you approaching that? So Jay-Z said it best in the line. He said, uh, he never told, who are you gonna tell we top of the totem pole, right? Like, I'm the top of the totem pole of media. If anyone needs to believe in measurement, it's me. I'm the one that makes the story for the brand team. They're not coming to me about measurement. They care about, did I see my ad when I, on my way to work? Uh, and so, you know, when it comes to measurement, I'm the top of the totem pole. Uh, so when people sell, like, because I have many different buying teams and agencies that report to me. And when they sell to me how this is going to perform, like, I'm going to take them to task on it, but I know that I'm the buck stop. So I'm not being pressured to come up with a measurement scheme here. I'm doing it for myself. Now, MMX is our golden standard 
of measurement, and the brand team does look to that. And I use that in strategic ways of getting agendas through for like my future planning. Um, but that's so long lead that, and, and we have products that are different, like entertainment, we have something different every time, that they don't want me going back a lot sometimes to see what worked. They want me to be reinventing and guessing what's gonna work. And so like that's my pressure. Uh, I'm not getting pressure to really prove measurement on my brands. That's it. All right. All right, Noble. Uh, actually, thank you so actually, much. Actually, just before we go, just in case anyone's wondering, um, we've put uh, Nobles has been putting a quarter for every f bomb into the jar. It's be like so the cocktail party tonight will be sponsored by Nobles. It's gonna hey, be great. Yo, yeah. put me on this. Put me on this. <laughs> <laughs>